Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for our December artwork talk. Um, while we're joined by speakers and participants from all over the globe, our talk is being hosted in Chibuktuk in Mi'kma'k in the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. We're honored to work, gather, and make art here. We're speaking today with Tiffany Shaw, BFA 2006, a Métis architect, artist, and curator based in Alberta, and with Todd Saunders, a Norway-based Canadian architect known for his international projects, joining us today from Toronto. And to get us started, uh, Tiffany, you said that you've got a presentation to show us, and then Todd, I think we'll go to you after that, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, just as like a little introduction into your practices as architects and as artists for Tiffany. And uh, that'll be our little intro into our talk today on how art influences architecture and how architecture influences art. And I'm Molly Cronin, I'm your host. And uh, we're gonna start off with Tiffany. <laughs> it's an honor to be with everyone right now. So thank you for um, providing this format for me. So this is my family. Um, my grandmother is on my left, Elizabeth King. My um, great grandmother is in the center holding me in her lap. And that's Margaret Pollan or Maggie, as we call her. And my mother, Brenda Fear, and on my right, and my brother, Jeffrey Shaw, my older brother, in her lap. And most of my work is around these figures in my life. Uh, my family comes from Fort McMurray, Alberta, by Fort Mackay and the Red River uh, through Metis lineage, uh, through the Toronto line. And um, most of my work is uh, like I'm a curator, an artist, and an architect. So a lot of my work is through them and my own two children and um, my brother's four children as well that uh, I help take care of as well. Uh, this is Pehonan. So this is one of my first public artworks um, that I created. Um, the worlds that I'm bringing together have to meet in the art and the architecture world. I'm always looking for the different kind of languages to resonate in both worlds so that I'm looking at new technologies or new materials on, 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 or new ways to misuse materials in these processes. And it's also through the, the lens of motherhood. So I, I, I learned about getting this commission that I won it 10 days into having my first child, Jasper. And so being a new mother and learning how to um, construct in the built environment was um, coinciding together. And so it was a really great experience to learn about what I can do as a female um, in this world. Um, another thing that I always like to look at is like, what is, what is the architectural language that we're doing? So like architects like to turn the corner, like how do these materials turn the corner and things like that. So I'm always looking at how to communicate these things to both worlds as well. Um, this is another project, uh, Canistanal Park in Edmonton. This is, oh, both of, this is the indigenous art park that I was just talking about here. And um, this, this project here is also close by in Edmonton as well. And um, this is about a red thread running through um, this area of Boyle Street, which is being redeveloped. And I use my family's pattern that you can see here. This is my great grandmother's moccasin beading pattern that I tried to scale up really large, uh, like super graphic style. And I'm thinking about how to keep things relevant um, in a craft or design context, but then also how can we make people feel welcome in these spaces that I know are largely indigenous. Um, in this particular location, there's a, a lot of vulnerable community members um, that are working through sex work or through uh, houselessness. Um, and I know that they will see this pattern as a Northern Cree Métis beading pattern. So it's there to welcome them. And I'm also looking at, I think this is sort of the nexus of my practice where I'm looking at invisible forces or um, not separating ourselves from land connection. So how does the water fall through these materials? How do we, instead of separating the elements from our design, how can we integrate with them and also have a, have a work-life flow with children? This is my second child, Aurora, that I had through this process. And so I'm trying to find connection with um, all of these life forces um, that hold us more resonant to life than separate us. And uh, I'm also an architect as well with, uh, so this is Métis Crossing Cultural Gathering Center that we built in 2019 for a Métis community for the Métis Nation of Alberta as a stakeholder. Um, and I'm just looking at the craft details there too. So I'm always trying to bring 
this idea of ingenuity as a Métis person, um, where we're not always in the past, we're always moving towards the future, but honoring our past and looking at these historic details and how we can bring them into the building in a craft sensibility that is achievable, um, buildable, and also beautiful. And then we also built a hotel that opened up in 2000 and well, actually opened up this summer, sorry. Um, and I was also looking at how to build those craft details. So like it was like a, a single person building these on their own in a way, like make them feel like they were doing it on their own rather than large groups of people putting these together. And um, I think this is, and this is Aurora here, she's three now. So um, we also did a uh, memorial at the site as well. And I'm thinking about how to replicate these materials in different in different ways. So these are, of course, wood like details. So this is like a replicating a birch pole out of aluminum um, and then creating that dovetail like joint out of concrete um, using like Z brush to model it and then cast it rather than actually doing board form work and stuff like that. So that's kind of in a nutshell what my work is representing these days in the last five years. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Such like interesting use of materials in those spaces. Um, I'm really excited to talk more about them. Um, but to get us, uh, but next we're going to move to Todd and then we'll come back and kind of ask questions as a group. Um, but Todd, I would love if you could take this moment to tell us a bit about your practice as an architect. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. Um, I'll try to be um, around the same time. Get back about myself. I'm actually from Newfoundland and I moved to Halifax and went to high school the last two years of high school in Halifax. And then um, I think I quit three universities before I went to NASCAD. But I was, in, I was 19 when I went into NASCAD. I finished in um, 92 in the environmental planning program. And then while I was there, I was, did an exchange student at the Rhode Island School of Design. So my, my, and then my, pra my background is mostly from art schools. Um, traveled a bit to, uh, worked in Vienna and Berlin, St. Petersburg, uh, and then went back in a master's degree at McGill in architecture. And um, I, I basically, I went to Norway right after that. I, I didn't go to my graduation. I just ended up there and uh, doing a lot of human rights work. Um, I learned Norwegian from a, a guy with Down syndrome. Uh, when I was working on a project with them for six months, um, I was working in a handicap a village with mentally handicapped adults, and then I went to Russia to work with them. It's a bit of a long story. Um, I, I started my own practice when I was about 26 years old. Uh, I never do that again. It was like it was a lot of it was really hard. <laughs> uh, about 10 years into my practice, uh, we did this project, uh, Lookout Point. Um, it's um, it was, the brief was actually a toilet and some park benches and uh, we made this instead. It, it can be described as a piece of sculpture and this is what I'll talk about. My work is uh, it, it's, it's like the, the right crossing point between art and architecture. And I think it's because of my background and the, and I did work on Fogo. Um, this is done by a philanthropist. It was 15 years ago. That's, I did my first project in Salt Spring Island in Canada and then on the opposite coast it did in Newfoundland. It was it was an amazing opportunity. And um, I speak to Zeta Cobb probably every Sunday for the last 15 years. It's been a, a great thing. Did maybe did four artist studios. I'll go quickly through them. Every, most people have seen them. They're all off the grid. Um, fantastic places to work. I, I dream of working there myself, but I haven't taken the time to actually borrow them. I, I spent one day working in them. Um, the tower studio inside. And then I just finished um, some while. It was the last building I did was a 100% off the grid dining hall about a food culture in Newfoundland. And now I'm doing other things like on the west coast of Norway, about an hour and a half boat ride from my, where I live. Uh, another community project with, it's with 360 women investors that started a gin company and a whiskey company. And um, I kicked the men out of it. And it was, um, this is a project I did in Labrador, it was in 2018. Um, my great-great-grandfather lived up there. And uh, so there's a book written about him uh, by Harold Horwood. And I, I got the project and uh, it's like a community center for, um, for the Nazi Abbott that lived in, uh, in Maine and then the offices of Parks Canada. Um, 
it, it, this turned out really well. It was a kind of my first uh, project in that size. And I, I, this is actually where I want to do more of these types of pro community-based projects. It was like a living room for the community. I'm trying to get this project built. It's, um, I'm going to run out of battery. Um, it's a sculpture, a stone sculpture museum on, on the, what, the west coast of Sweden. Um, and I've doing, done some projects a bit like the Owl and Look at a Show. This is a stair project. Uh, I was actually hired as an artist, not an architect here. And these are some of the houses I just recently completed. Uh, we work with people that really take their time. This is to, built by the owner, it took five years. This also took six years to build. Um, in, it's like right beside where I live. And Edvard Grieg, the composer, um, was right down here in his house. And this is from the Grieg family. Um, this could be categorized as a piece of sculpture, like you're kind of living in a piece of sculpture. And, a, and a, the owner is a big art collector. This is my own house and inside. And the way I work, I work really closely with the builders. Uh, this stair is really expensive if I built it out of steel and half, almost really expensive as epoxy. And then I actually just built it for like a tenth of the prize with a really cheap plywood. I just sat down with some people and really made it together. And these are the houses we're finishing up right now. Um, just won a prize. Just won the um, the Architizer Prize just a while ago in New York. Just this year. Uh, and this is a bit what I'm a this is most of what my architecture is about, like creating spaces for um, peace of mind and, and these like really nice landscape. And, and the way we work is actually, it's like nature first, architecture second. And we always, uh, that's the kind of approach we do it. Uh, this is actually for a, a landscape architect. I worked with a Canadian I worked with in the Channel Islands like years ago. She decided to retire in the Salt Spring Island, and this is her studio. And on the floor, are all all my sketches of the design process. There, she epoxied them in. I didn't know this until I arrived, and it was like five years of her her and I writing back together. It was a, you know. So to summarize, um, my work has kind of been like it's evolving. It's a it's a it's a balance between like art and craft and architecture, and. Um, Kind of no frills, um, like bit like Newfoundland, very uncomplicated, uh, not many details, and like boiling it down to the essence. So, uh, so thank you. I just stopped chatting. Well, it was so excellent to get to see so much of both of your practices. Maybe while Todd making that switch, Tiffany, I'll ask you a bit about your experience at NASCAD. Maybe if you could tell me if and how your time at NASCAD informed your practice as an artist, architect, and curator? Yeah, it really was a formative part of um, my experience. Uh, I was younger when I moved to Halifax and I did an interdisciplinary degree in film, video, and sound. And I worked in the multimedia uh, department and um, I, really actually loved how you opened up with the land acknowledgement. I think what I really felt at that time was not an, a connection to my indigenous identity. I mean, that's a, that was a common experience through all of my schooling. Um, and so I've been watching NASCAD's evolution in its, in its acknowledgement of indigenous people. And so it's been interesting to see like how people, I'm also part of a collective called Otsitsi One Contemporary Art Collective. And we've hired people who come from students from NASCAD like Laura Greer, who started the indigenous um, students group, things like that. So um, I've always been really proud of being a part of that, but I think um, Jan Peacock was always sort of like a mainstay for me through that course of time. And um, I remember when I applied for grad school for, um, for uh, architecture, she sent me film, um, and she sent me film applications to apply for, which I think meant that she thought I should go into film instead of architecture. So I love that she always like advocated for what she thought that I could be doing in the world, um, which made me feel like mentorship or peer support. And um, it was always fun to like think about crazy stories like Vito Oconchi, like biting someone's leg in the, the <laughs> in the department. So it was a rich experience because in Alberta, we don't have the same sense of community on the level that Halifax does. And so 
seeing such a great culture of people kind of going out all at one night into multiple galleries versus Edmonton at the time when they would just like only have one opening every week for every spe special person, um, which seemed like a lot of pressure. I was able to see like the possibilities of collision in Halifax. And so that was nice to bring that back to Alberta and then keep that sensibility when I went through grad school about the nuances of adult education in a format that was more open and free and expressive than I would have received in Alberta. Excellent. Um, Todd, can you tell us a bit about your time at NASCAD and how it impacted your practice? Um, it's really funny. I saw Neil, uh, Neil's name, the ceramics, uh, Neil Forrest is on the call here. I, mean, I, I brought up a lot of memories. Uh, Neil was in uh, Norway a couple of years ago. We hooked up and then remind, uh, when I went to Nascot, I actually did a minor in ceramics. And I, had, I really wanted to go that direction. And I, I don't know if it was, um, I was very young. I was like in my 19, 20 and um, where I was working very hard and uh, it really clicked when I went to RISD. Um, that's when I really appreciated my time at NASCAD. I was, went to RISD and then realized we were like very theoretically strong at NASCAD and um, had a lot. And then the teachers down there really noticed it and I started appreciating NASCAD in a different light. I got knocked over on my first crit at, at, at RISD. It was, it was really hard, I thought, because I was doing well at NASCAD. Um, I worked at the um, at the Scotia Mall at the grocery store there Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday. That was a big part of my life. Actually, I kind of just I worked uh, there and worked at the school, and it was like constant. Um, I learned a lot of like values then about putting down, focusing on one thing, and that's that's paid off. Um, um, and I I just really enjoyed the library. It kind of like more part of my life is very extroverted but then there's this introvert side of me that I really discovered in the library in Nascad and I my love of books is still there and right just yesterday I'm, I got an, a gig with the University of Toronto building a little library uh, for two people on FOGO with the students this summer so all kind of good and then a couple of years ago when I got the honorary doctor degree at Nascad that was it was a nice feeling it was kind of 20 something years after and uh, so it, it affected me quite much I, I would love to go back like if that sounds really funny I would love to do another degree there it would be great to do that now at uh, being more mature which one would you do I would do sculpture and oh. would do ceramics I was I was really funny this uh, well-known artist was in Fogo this summer Sharon Langdon I didn't know who she was she was in the ceramic studio and I was there a few months before that with someone from Yale I was teaching at. And um, and then I made a like a piece of ceramics and I picked it up three months after. And Sharon Langdon said, Oh, who the hell is that? He's like that guy knows how to make ceramics. And then um, people told him who I was out there, but it was there's there a love there and that. So ceramics and sculpture and I'd love to do art here. I, I'd love to do it all. I would like to spend the rest of my life at NASCAD if I could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Neil's cheering you on in the in the <laughs> <laughs> and Jan is on the call too. Sorry, Tiffany, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, that's okay. Hi, Jan. Um, I uh, I also really loved like I went and toured the Dalhousie department before thinking like should I go to Dalhousie for architecture or should I go to NASCAD for art. Mm -hmm. And um, I really just didn't like the environment at Dalhousie, like the, the spaces didn't feel great. And then I just loved how I got lost continuously in NASCAD, like there was no <laughs> map and you just like, took you like maybe a couple extra minutes to get to each class because you were just like, which stairwell is it again? I love that feeling. Well, you uh, designed, you, go, you, took that, you took that inspiration and designed spaces that move much more efficiently, I'm sure. <laughs> How not to design an interior. I well, guess. no, I, 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 but I love NASCAD's environment. I don't yeah, think I would do anything. Yeah. Like, I love how when you go through each of the doorways, it's a different building um, when yeah. you're in some parts of it. And like, there's that cultural memory built in there. Like, you're not, you're sort of part of something and that it's not a singular experience. It feels in that way. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you've both spoken really well to the kind of community present in both the building and the kind of Mm. broader community of NASCAD. So thank you both so much. 
Um, I'd love to turn it to our topic today to how art influences architecture and architecture influences art. Um, maybe Todd, we'll start with you. I'd love to hear about how you think about the process of integrating artwork into the spaces you design. Maybe we could talk a bit about particular projects where you felt that that was really relevant, maybe the sculpture museum, but uh, we'll let you take it away and then we'll go to Tiffany after that. Yeah, um, uh, my process is really uh, influenced by by art, like the way artists make it. And recently, just like a couple of years ago, I adapted this process from Richard Serra where he uses verbs. Verbs are, and that was kind of the convinced my staff uh, to not be so passive. So action verbs, um, um, and like, how do you turn, for example, the word care into a piece of architecture? And it's so ambivalent and open-ended that it is a great way to test things out. And because I work with all these artists, like I guess, sit on the board at the Fogel Island Arts, I used to there and I, I know all these people and I listen to what, how they create. And um, it's very different than regular art, like, the architecture process is very different than the art process. And I, I learn more and more from them and their creative. And then on terms on the other side, the fabrication part, I learned a lot. I, I was with Carol Bouvet uh, last year watching, I was just amazed at uh, how similar their design process was. I thought artists built everything they made, but it was actually a lot of like transferring a, a drawing, a 3D model to a fabrication and how they worked. Um, and it's in, and I also I like the, the way the artists uh, constantly challenge their process where architects kind of like lock into a process and they stick to it. Uh, we're, it really irritates my staff that we're constantly changing the process because there's some people that are, want to be complacent and repeat a process. And uh, there's certain things we do and um, we repeat but I'm kind of always wanting to grow and that's where I picked up at art school there was like always challenging the status quo and then there's the, the rigor and architecture that I I see in the, the really good artist it was like send a quote to a friend the other day Philip Glass said something it's uh, practice and you get better it's that simple and I see that in the um, some of the really art, good artists I admire and some of the art, art artists. So, so you think artists and architects can learn a lot from each other in these? Uh, absolutely. Well, you, in like both those, prof call them professions, they're like the world's your oyster. Actually, you can learn something like everywhere in those two professions if you keep your ears open and your eyes. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, I'm going to turn the question over to you. How do you find that art influences architecture and vice versa in your practices? Um, I, you know, I try not to really separate them so much. I just sort of see it as one world. Um, like when I'm in an artist space, it becomes very obvious that it is not an architectural space and vice versa. So you can really mm. see the different worlds when you're in them, but the way that my mind works doesn't separate them. And I, I feel like it's a feedback. It's like, I can tune chew on something in one way. And then when I flip it, to a detail, I can refine it even better to where I want it to be. Like, I think if I was just an artist, I would always be struggling with refining that detail because I wouldn't have the language to get there in the way that some artists are not able to continue to translate their ideas. Like it's interesting how the fabrication process can be such a mystery um, because of um, because of the type of project management that can happen or because of the type of materials that are available locally. And so it's sort of, I think what it allows for, for having knowledge in both places, I get more agency to create a voice that is unique. Um, I saw this one, or I heard this one thing in grad school at SciArc in Los Angeles, where I did my studies. Um, and it was more of an arts-based um, architecture practice there, which is why it worked so well for me. It was more around making and modeling. Um, they had said that well, I had, I had noticed all the renders, like you could tell what program people were spitting our designs out of. You could tell if it was Rhino or AutoCAD or Autodesk or all of these things or what kind of rendering um, machine they were using you, or, or program, you could always tell. And um, we talked about how we had to take control over what the machine was helping us do. So you can even tell like when you're typing into Google, for example, um, it'll finish 
like in Gmail, it'll finish your sentences for you. So you have you have to be really particular or, or understand that your your language is being crafted for you exactly. So, or in a way. So what I'm always looking for is like, where is my voice in the discourse of art and architecture and how is it meeting both worlds? I also think that there's a reciprocal process that I'm looking for, which I think comes from my indigenous identity and also from the studio that I work in with Reimagine Architects. They've been working with indigenous communities for over 30 years and they learned that process very quickly about always engaging multiple voices. And so I'm always bringing my family into my process. And then when I'm working on larger projects, community just kind of helps breathe life into the projects rather than it having to be my idea. It's their idea that we're helping translate in a number of ways. So it's really like my favorite is when someone, when no one can like claim an idea because we kind of all kind of came up with it together. It was this iterative process where someone layered one idea. And then as you build along, it's like stewardship. And it also helps embrace people. And I think to add to that, the ultimate idea I have around um, these spaces is I would like these spaces to reflect my family that have been here for decades, centuries. And I feel like these spaces still don't do that. Like when I, I, I remember very, very vibrantly going to the Fort McMurray hospital to visit my great uncle. Um, I was thinking about how my family continues to go to this hospital for generations and it still doesn't reflect them, even though there's a large indigenous population in Fort McMurray and they only just had like a medicine wheel or a, or a, some kind of circular object just above the elevator and like that was it. And so I just, I've always felt like we need to create spaces that reflect our cultures, that create the complexity of life rather than resist people. And that could be public art. I find people are actually more authoritative over public art than architecture, which helps me really understand my contracts a lot better. Like artists are so savvy in understanding process and where their time is worth, where architects have less understanding of that because we sort of are built in with a great economy of um, health insurance, <laughs> stability of jobs. And so there's a lot that people take for granted in the architecture world that artists cannot take for granted because they're sort of always trying to figure out their next contract or their next item of business or project that may or may not come through. One thing I also love is that artists don't compromise that often, whereas architects are always compromising. Like there's always a solution and we can fit that bathroom into this space. And um, I, it makes me kind of, I've, as I've been getting older, I've been realizing that maybe I should not be compromising so much in my architecture and think more about my artistic practice of like what actually works and what doesn't work. So when Todd was talking about words that reciprocate like care in spaces, I'm also trying to investigate how do buildings not make people feel like they're resistant? Like how can they flow and, and allow for emotion and ephemeral things to take place? I think there's a fine line between collaboration, compromise, consultation, learning to like incorporate those voices and how the project can be improved by this like group of voices as a part of it. But also, yeah, where you kind of take the hits as the designer yeah. or artist. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, maybe we'll talk a bit about your art practice a little bit. Like I, I was thinking about some of your public art pieces like Métis Land Use, for example, and there were some other pieces that you showed in your presentation. And I was wondering about how, because your artwork, um, much like architecture, takes into consideration, or seems to me at least, like how bodies move through space. It's very kind of architectural in a lot of ways in the way it's like presented. Um, can you tell me a bit more about maybe the project Métis Land Use and or about why it's so uh, significant for you to incorporate the beadwork designs that you do? Oh yeah, um, I'll just talk about the beadwork first. So um, my, whenever my grandma, my great grandmother was a moccasin maker in Fort McMurray and she never taught us how to make moccasins. Like that was her job. So she always sort of separated that. She did teach my mom, my mother how to bead um, because my mom begged her. Um, and so my mom taught me how to bead, but we decided to take moccasin making courses together to just like, we wanted to make our own moccasins. And, um, whenever we go in those classes, we never knew. I, they always say like, find a pattern online and, and look that up. So I'd always be looking at like cream AT beading patterns and I could never find one that I liked. I always felt like I was copying. 
And then um, my grandmother had given me some patterns that my great grandmother had created for the moccasins and the mucklucks and stuff like that, that she would like felt or bead or embroider or so. And then I felt like I really actually had something that was my own, that was my family's that I could move forward. And that's when like my whole practice kind of really came together in terms of how I had something that I could shift. And so, so I water jet cut the patterns. Now I, um, I use, I laser cut them. I cast them. I create glass castings and it's a nice way to think about how we're continuing something in our family in a way that we exist today, rather than always thinking about it in a traditional practice. So the pattern is really just to meant to talk about survival and thriving and a place for all of us to belong. And also it tries to sit within the design discourse of multiple methods of resolution so that it doesn't just sit in one place. And so that's what the pattern is about. But I'm always trying to think about how can we translate our ideas through material and how will material make us feel over time? So I'm not just thinking about what is that material doing in the time that it's created, but how will it shift and shape over 15 to 20 years? And how will that continually make you feel like, are you a part of it or are you separate from it? And so that idea around bodies moving through these spaces, it's really important for me to feel like you're a part of the work, not separate. And so sometimes I'll put things that move or things that reflect to capture your own identity. And then also try and really think about scale. So things that aren't too big or too small when it's public art, say it's something that they can like sit on or walk around. And Métis Land Use um, is a project. I was just thinking I probably should show some quick slides to show that project. It, cause it, it just looks so different from how I would describe it. It is based around this idea of how people, Métis people use the land. And um, I thought I should do around script, which is a complicated history. So I placed script on the glass of the bus shelter um, to talk about the process of how people would get land or money uh, as Canada disenfranchised us, like uh, extinguish our Aboriginal title. So when they were signing First Nations into treaty, they were also creating script for Métis people. And it was very long and arduous. This was like one person's process of how to get land or script. It was ridiculous. But then I also looked at this like, concept, which was helped spearheaded by Frank Tuff, who runs the Métis Archival Project Lab in the U of A, where he, where he, this is like his work around script. He said, usually, like, if you want to talk about how Métis people use land, you have to talk, you have to talk about how they occupy and move around the land. And because we're, not a nomadic group of people, we're a group that moves around for very important reasons during different seasons to utilize resources that help us survive. So this shows the patterns of like the locations where you go for duck hunting or for fishing or for the Red River cart trails, um, uh, the, the settlements that were created for Métis people in the Red River area. And so I recreated those lines here. Um, and then these are the posts that were created for each of like Lane's Post, Upper Fort Gary, Lower Fort Gary. And I'm just looking at different ways to, like this is Upper Fort Gary and Lower Fort Gary. So this is where Treaty 1 was signed. And then this is where the um, provisional government for the Métis people were um, uh, signing here. And so I'm looking at what is the architecture of this of these buildings. So they both use limestone, but they use them differently. Um, this one also had the dovetail like joint. So I like sheared it instead of, so I'm just trying to like recreate new details, I guess. Um, and then this is where the two rivers are crossing the Red River and the Assiniboine River. So I'm trying to like create resolution around what this place looks like physically. And then this is, I had the least amount of information for this post, which was really related to the Red River cart. And so like you can turn this piece for little children and it, the steel will change over time with the fingerprints. And then it'll sort of also reflect, I'm really thinking about reflection in terms of my own indigenous identity, but also anyone's or, or they're akin to the their relationship with the land or with themselves. So that's sort of what that project was about. <laughs> Sorry, it was so much. No, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing those slides. It's such an interesting project and such a like fascinating way to think about land use and mapping and movement. So thank you so much, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Todd, I'd like to turn it over to you now if we could. And I'd love to talk a bit about um, Fogo Island and I think especially about how you brought 
craft and design into the interiors of the inn and why that process went the way it did and why it was so important to designing those spaces. Could you tell us a bit about the Outport Aesthetics Workshop and about the design for the interiors of the Fogo Island Inn? Yeah, yep. Um, we were working on the project for a couple of years and, and it started getting constructed and then we had to go inside to, um, to, to, yeah, to fit it out and furnish it and what atmosphere you can make. Um, and the whole process scared me a bit because it got very mechanical and hermetic in, in a way. And then and I was trying to translate like like 400 years of that type of building tradition that we were working into like uh, nowness and then into the future and I had to couldn't put my I, I, I knew what it was in like inside me um, but I didn't know how to draw it um, like one of the first commissions I got there was to draw nine houses for artists and it was my first commission I just got my first employee I just had my first child um, and I couldn't do it it was like a, it, it was um so I called Zita Cobb after two weeks and I said, this is absurd. I can't draw a better house than Newfoundland, uh, like a Newfoundland house. So I suggested it, okay, I'll draw the studios, but why don't you buy old houses and fix them up? And during that process of fixing it up, uh, I, I really got an intimate knowledge of Newfoundland architecture, how everything was handmade. And then at the realization, that's what we needed to make is something handmade and everything. And I asked, uh, Zita after a while about being very worried about it and I said why can't we make everything inside by hand and she goes why not we've been doing that forever since we've been here so we took that approach to the outport aesthetics and then I'm I'm a big proponent of um, giving um, young people that want to start their own practice a chance uh, ones that really have the guts to start off right after school so we reached out to a bunch of different schools and asked if they had any recent grads who started a company and um, if they're interested in furniture design. And we, and we got people from all around the world and they came for a few weeks. And the brief for the workshop, the Outport Sex was actually a poem. Uh, it's quite a long poem. And, and basically what they did, they just wandered around. There was no end product um, and there was no, we suggested they didn't draw, they made prototypes. And that was based on the way that people in Newfoundland, no one, no one made drawings. They made uh, uh, prototypes of a boat and um, models, and then they built it. And so what we did, we started, uh, like, we needed a chair, we needed a table, and every chair and a table and rug had a story behind it. And then uh, the, 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 the designer was coupled up with a few local builders. And then the local builders were actually allowed to interpret the, with the, the designers would send a prototype like a mock-up and then the builders would make their version of it and then there were the dialogue started so it was very conversational and that's how it went and it went on and on and on and there's like there's a thousand success stories from that process that I'm still meeting I was in Iceland last year and I met someone that was there 15 years ago that I hadn't seen that like we both had aged <laughs> it's kind of funny and then it was um was this hand was a, a very it was good, like uh, what Tiffany's talking about, like, I think she knows it from her culture. My, like the handmade is being lost in design or in, in craft. And I think we're moving, like my culture is like, I'm trying to reintroduce back that, like most of the buildings in Newfoundland are designed by architects from Toronto. And it's, um, it's kind of like uh, flattening our culture. So I made an attempt that to be a proud of our culture and it wouldn't happen if I didn't move away. I think I really appreciated Newfoundland after I lived away for a while and saw the beauty of it. And um, I think that's, I can't speak for Tiffany, but the indigenous people are observing that their, their culture is extremely beautiful, extremely rich. And we have to, you know, go back and not lose that knowledge. And that's what I tried to do. Uh, we tried to do in the interiors. Yeah. And it worked out really well. Oh, I was at a wood conference a couple of days ago and there was someone talking about mass timber and creating CLT structures. And it was the most terrifying thing because he kept talking about how you have to like just automate things and not customize and just make it a factory. And then it'll mm. just do all this stuff. And I was just like, this is not, there's no local quality. There's no mm. human capacity in this. And it doesn't 
uplift local communities. It keeps mm -hmm. the resources out and it like there's so much of a bigger conversation about shared stories and architecture and art can kind of do that. It can lift up communities in powerful ways that people are not always understanding. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good point. And I think this uh, idea of like attaching it, when I, I gave a lecture last year at, uh, when I was teaching at Yale and then um, the, the, the end of it was basically, yeah, I can travel around the world doing lots of architecture and getting all these commissions. But what I really most appreciate is actually picking out a few communities like Fogo, I've worked for 15 mm -hmm. years, this island I'm working on, Fai, I've been there five years with the Katahdin National Park with, with the Wabinaki, I'm working there like four years now. So it's grabbing it or not grabbing but like, like focusing on one place and going deep into it I know. and I, I think that's where the where maybe I learned that at NASCAD or even before well I just think that there's so much richness in in these cultures that that continue to need to be explored like it's not done it's not seen mm. well yeah. and so I also have like a large fear of um, getting too many big commissions because then it pulls me away from creating where I actually want to create, like helping yeah. the kids I actually want to be with. So mm -hmm. I actually really try hard not to be in the media too much, or I mm -hmm. try not to like get, I have a very big fear of getting too big because I just think, wh who is my work going to be for then if I allow myself to get too big? Yeah. I mean, it's maybe a fear. Fascinating, guys. Thank you so much. We're going to turn it over to our guests now. If anybody has any questions for Todd and for Tiffany. This is your chance to either speak up on your video or pop in the chat with the questions. Yes, I have a question for both speakers. Um, some of your constructions scare me. Are they still going to be up in another 50 years? How do you make sure that the construction is going to be to work? <laughs> Are you both working with trained architects? Um, I'll take that one first. Um, so I'm a registered architect. And so I have legal responsibilities to make sure that my construction is, is sound. But also I work with structural engineers that have a larger responsibility to make sure that these things stay up. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, a, a very largely vetted process to be building in the built environment. You have a lot of permits, you have a lot of um, warranties, you have a lot of checks and balances that you have to be accountable to. So all of these structures will stand. I think what these structures are looking at though is trying, trying to take a little bit more of an emotional connection to the projects it's responding to. And um, the the cladding that I used on Métis Crossing, for example, um, for both the hotel and the cultural gathering center is an Akoya product. It's a wood that's um, basically put in a vat of vinegar. It's an acetylytic process to harden it um, to be more of a hardwood rather than a softwood, which is what it starts out as, like pine, basically a pine species. And it has a 50 year warranty unpainted uh, outside of the ground and a 25 year warranty inside the ground. So those will definitely be there for a little while. And I'm really excited to see how those shift and shape over time. My, my response is quite similar. I'm a registered architect in Norway. Uh, when I do all my construction the details there, um, outside of Norway, for example, in Toronto, like in Toronto, I have a local architect. We're doing, we just finished a project in Muskoka and, and we're starting another one in Georgian Bay, another one in Prince Edward Ca uh, County. Uh, Calgary, I work with another architect. Um, in Vancouver, we've, we've done it. And Fogo is actually with another architect, um, technical architect. They're called Architects of Records. So as soon as I step out of Norway, um, I have to... Um, to use an architect record and it's a specific contract with that with each architect association around the world and we it is actually helps us it goes back to what tiffany's saying it's allowed us to stay small because we can increase our bandwidth if we want to um there's um the person we're doing the the company we're doing our, our the katahdin national park monument building with is uh from connecticut and they, we've been working together for six years on other projects before so um, we have a relation. We also have really good structural engineers. And the reason why I'm in, in Toronto this week is actually to meet um, an architect of record um, to help with the project here. So it's, uh, and, and, the, and the, the, that's a good question. Like I just finished a book uh, called Share where I interviewed 30 Nordic architects. And I asked one guy, uh, there was a couple 
uh, and both of them asked them uh, how long would one what's the longest their building would last and, and they're all wooden buildings because maybe that's why you asked the question and um, they they said the structure will last forever and the exterior cladding will probably have to be changed and when i live in norway there's buildings that are over 900 years old the stave churches and then they're 900 years old um, the fishing shacks in the city i live in bergen um, they're wood um, it's just the way they're detailed they're, as long as the wood is allowed to dry out it can last very, very, very long. Uh, unfortunately, the quality of wood in the world is going down and the quality of the wood from those times, are, it's really, really good. So, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I've actually made a bet that the Fogel Island will be there 500 years from now. So I'm, cause it's, and, and the reason why it's not about material, it's about the building is loved. And I think if you invest in culture and invest in, I'm, I'm the, invest is the wrong word, but if you build a building with care, made by hand, made with love, and the community loves it, uh, the community will keep it together. Yeah. And that's what I've seen in Norway, and that's what I, I, you see it in small towns around Canada as well. People will take care of something they love. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with uh, technical details, really. Yeah. So, so you both had additional training. You, you got your sort of creative artistic training at Nerfstead, but then also got training as an, uh, as an architect. I worked as a carpenter uh, when I first went to Norway, and, and and when I was in when I went to Nascad in the summers, I built the roof trusses and floor trusses at a, at a concern. So, and I I know I know how to build. I, I don't I'm not a great builder, but I I learned more about building. Uh, we built a cabin when I was little with my uncle, and my dad when I was fourteen. I learned more of that building that cabin. Than I did all of architecture school, mm -hmm. so I think um, it's just I, it was the, the luck of the draw the way I learned things. Yes, yeah, similarly, I learn a lot, a lot more through my detailing of our public art projects because these details don't exist. So there's not a stock detail, oh, yeah. you know, about the vapor barrier and things like that. So I learn a lot more crafting um, that helps bring itself to architecture. Thanks, Carol. We've got Neil, who's got his hand raised there. If Neil, you have a question for the group. Um, I do. Uh, Todd, I'm looking for a carpenter for a new deck, um, but <laughs> I guess we can talk about that later. I, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank both um, uh, Tiffany and, and Todd for terrific uh, presentations and, and conversation, so I'm uh, most appreciative. Um, but I, I have a question. Uh, I have many questions, but the first one that, that um, I would like to ask of, of each of you um, is that uh, landscape strongly prefigure, prefigures into each of your works. Um, your commissions, uh, uh, certainly more, uh, you, you could see in, um, in your uh, images, Todd, uh, that they're in dramatic um, sites. Uh, the same may be true for, for Tiffany's work. I, I'm wondering if each of you um, could, could discuss your work in terms of the landscape and the, the, either the subtlety or the, the the contrasts that you're building, and why would you do one more than the other? Um, if, if you know if those binaries um, uh, or my descriptions work, and I'm not sure that they do, but if you could, um, um, you know, each look at that for a moment. Yeah, maybe I can go first on this one, Tiffany. Um, my relationship to landscape is is like a, it's a double edged sword. It, I don't want to build in these pristine landscapes. Like I've said no to a lot of projects in these places because people, it's a wrong in the understanding of putting something in the landscape. My the commissions we work on, uh, we try to um, comp not complement the landscape, but we give the. Um, a different experience that the landscape doesn't give. That was basically with the Ireland look at it. It was a very beautiful thing, but you didn't experience because you were sitting in a car all the time. We wanted to bring people to the landscape. Uh, Fogo is more of, we built a wooden platform around it. I can remember Zita Cobb saying the day we started construction, um, she goes, she said all the bill, uh, she's like a nature freak as well. Um, if they kill one blueberry, she'll kill them. Uh, she was very protective because the Nordic landscape gets destroyed very easily. And um, so, so I think I, I'm getting these commissions because we really respect the landscape. But at the same time, I say no to these commissions when I don't feel they're right. 
uh, and on another level that my interest is actually working in, in with uh, communities and like making neighborhoods and, and working in urban areas if I can. But when I went to Norway, I was a 26 year old that didn't have any money, didn't speak the language at the time. I didn't get those commissions. So it's on, not until now, like when I'm in my fifties that I'm getting that. And I, I wanna also focus on um, working in urban areas. So we had to be very, very careful with the amount of landscape we have left. And I think architects should be saying no more often than those commissions when we leave the, leave the land. Yeah, I, that's a lovely answer. Um, there's this concept in indigenous communities called land-based learning, and it's a way to connect to the land in many ways, whether you're inside or actually outside or how you're hmm. foraging or harvesting. Um, so I'm always thinking about how can the building enable land-based learning. Um, so the, the cultural gathering center has this very large deck that's enough for 350 people. The inside hall is for 350 people as well. They wanted to build it for 700, but we discussed how creating a hall for 700 people an hour and a half away from any like um, he um, heavily, uh, like a urban center was not a great performa. So we could still create this deck for a little less cost. Um, and, but what actually happened with that deck was when you're sitting on the deck in the winter time, it's a few degrees warmer than when you're off the deck. And when you're in the summertime, it's a few degrees cooler in the shade than when you're outside. And so it actually really helped, it creates it basically a, a large vestibule that helps transition from the inside to the outside, which creates more capability to be outside for longer periods of time in a comfortable environment. And I have a, similar to what Todd's saying, I have a, I don't really like things lasting forever. I, I'm sort of sitting with that feeling of, I love things returning back to the earth. And um, I find if there's a way for us to create responsibly and sustainably, which is the firm that I work with is always thinking about sustainable efforts and how we can live lightly on the earth, which is also an indigenous principle as well. I think that helps relate to land-based practices more directly. And sustainability is such a broad term, like not just in terms of your building details that help you not have air conditioning, for example, because you use passive cooling, but also like how can you create sustainability within the landscape? How do you flow water back into the landscape rather than destroy? Because water can be is so powerful. And how can the community be a part of that process in terms of operation, ownership, and maintenance? Um, those are things that I'm just always so fascinated by. There is an invisible process that not a lot of people know about, but still relate back to the land. So they're a bit more ephemeral ideas, but really important. That's wonderful, Tiffany. Thanks so much. Yeah. Todd, Tiffany, thank you both so much for joining us today. It was a fascinating chat. I've put links to both of your websites in the chat. If anybody would like to look at more work from Tiffany and Todd, please do. Uh, and thanks again. This was so wonderful. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Tiffany and Molly, everyone. Okay. Yeah, great to see everybody. Thank you so much.